Welcome, Facebook live stream audience. We're so happy to have you with us. You're backstage at Change It Up Radio here with Paula Shaw. And my guest in studio today is John Sahar, an attorney from North County, San Diego area. And we're going to be talking about some interesting things today. We're going to be talking about the cost of isolation, how it can lead to depression, addiction, and one of the groups who's most affected by feeling isolated and alienated these days actually is attorneys. <laughs> Not John, of course. He's, he's one of the exceptions. That's why we're bringing him in to talk about it. But we do have a real problem with that. And also, I want to clue you in on one thing. We're kind of recording this show backwards today because the final segment is going to be done with my daughter, who's calling in for the Millennial Moment segment. And um, she needs to leave shortly. So we're going to record her segment first. Change It Up Radio is recorded. It's not a live show. And it does air on Saturday and Sunday evenings at 7 o'clock if you want to hear it on air or on all major podcast platforms out there. So I think we are just about ready. Let me see if... Oh. You guys are ready? Yeah. Is Aaron, check? is Aaron on? I'm oh, here. Oh, mic check. John, do you want to say check? something? Check. Can you hear me? We're good. Just, you're, you're good with him? All right. We're good with Aaron? Aaron is on the yep, phone. She's thank ready you. To go. And what, what was that, Todd? Aaron is on the phone. She's ready to go. Okay, good. And Aaron, say something so I can see if your levels are okay. I can hear you. Hello, hello. <laughs> there Hi, you Aaron. are. Aaron, meet Hi, John. John. How are you? I'm good. How are you? <laughs> I've heard so many wonderful things. Thank you for being awesome and looking out for my mom. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> All right, darling. Um, so I have to get my I have to wrap my head around the fact that we haven't actually talked about all this stuff yet, but we're going to talk about um, the I, the cost of isolation in what we're going to discuss with you and what you and I had talked about earlier. All righty. Okie doke. Okay, mm-hmm. okay. John, if you will push that green button for me. Okay, cool. <laughs> Welcome back to Change It Up with Paula Shaw. This is our Millennial Moment segment, and along with John Sahar, attorney who has been chatting with me for the the last couple segments here about this problem of depression and alienation and isolation, especially among certain uh, segments of our population, him representing the one of lawyers. But right now, we, uh, we are bringing on my daughter, who is an entrepreneur, a singer, and the author of the upcoming book, Have Baggage, Will Travel. Aaron and I are also doing a podcast together called Bridges, in which we do a mother-daughter, multi-generational view of trending topics. So mm-hmm. one of the reasons that I'm bringing Aaron into this discussion today is because we've been looking at certain groups that are affected today by feeling alienated, isolated, actually even lonely, and how this is causing problems of depression, addiction, and all sorts of issues that are coming as a result of it. So Aaron, John and I have talked about attorneys being affected by this, other segments of Mm -hmm. society, certainly the elderly. But Mm -hmm. one of the groups that really surprises me that's being affected by it is young people. That doesn't make sense. When I was your age, we were hanging out. You know, we were um, we were getting together. We were watching football games together and doing those sorts of things. So why? What's the problem with the young people, do you think? Well, there was a great article in The Atlantic last year that was called Have Smartphones Destroyed a Generation? Mm-hmm. Oh. And um, it was something that really caught my eye, just sort of, you know, in my routine scroll of, of news and media and all that. And one of the things I found so interesting about this article was it talked about how um, the newer generation of millennials, so those that were born, you know, within the last 16 to 17 years, 
um, are the safest generation. They, mm. they're, the numbers of car accidents and teen pregnancy and drinking underage and all that are astronomically lower than younger genera- or older generations, excuse me, mine included. I'm a Gen Y millennial, mm-hmm. was born in the mid-80s. Um, but they, this particular generation has also reported uh, astronomically higher levels of depression, anxiety, isolation, and, and not feeling connected. So for a generation of kids that are constantly connected through their phones and through social media, yeah. uh, you'd think that those numbers would correlate to, to more happiness. But according to the studies that were written about in this particular piece, uh, there was a disconnect there. So I don't know if I would be comfortable speaking for an entire generation. That was just, you know, a certain <laughs> I'll take a shot. Yeah. Yeah. But I wonder sometimes if maybe technology and social media in particular are um, helping or hurting depending on how they're being used. Mm -hmm. So, for example, um, I'm in my early 30s. When I was in my mid-20s, the vast majority of my close girlfriends were getting married the same year that I was getting out of a relationship, (laughs) which was terrible. (laughs) (laughs) I well remember. um, Yeah. (laughs) And, you know, I remember having this feeling of seeing on, you know, Facebook and and Instagram all these people that were getting engaged and celebrating these highlight moments in their life. And then me feeling like I was in, you know, the the doldrums of my own. And so one of the things that, that you and I have talked about on our podcast is that social media really just shows your highlight reel. And it doesn't show what's really going on. But there's no way to like engage with the realities of somebody's life day in day out unless you are seeing them in person and having those interpersonal communications and conversations so i think with this generation leaning a bit more on texting and reaching out through social media and messaging and that sort of thing uh there's probably less of in-depth connection that happens through those um facets than if you sat down over coffee or something to talk to someone. And I wonder if perhaps we're not getting the full story because we're speaking in a more superficial way where we're kind of just cutting to the chase in all of our communications. So then when we see these people's highlight reels on their social media or we hear about just the, the good news, then and we're not reading their body language or their facial expressions, we're not really seeing how they're doing. Mm-hmm. They're just telling us mm-hmm. that we then, in my estimation, we compare our own lives to just the, the high points of theirs and how could we not feel inadequate by comparison. Oh, it, it reminds me of something I heard a professor say when I was in school, that uh, a psychology professor, that we're always comparing our insides with other people's outsides. And it's a tough right. comparison, right? Because we know what our internal pain feels like. And you're right. Uh, when everybody, it's, it's sort of like the Christmas letter that comes around, you know, where everybody shares all these perfect, wonderful things going on in their lives. But we all know that that isn't reality. That isn't how life works. And sure. I, I find, you know, I, I think about sometimes young people I, and I, I picture them like sitting in their bedrooms with their computers and their phones, you know, instead of out at the, at the hamburger place or cruising. Remember, John? Did, when guys used to cruise the main drag when oh, we were every, kids. Every Friday and Saturday. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and well, and like, getting in trouble as a teenager is like part of the experience. Right. I mean, you know, I went to parties in high school and drank terrible beer. And, you know, I feel like those are... Those are our moments that, you know, formulate part of your character. Not that I advocate for people doing dangerous things, but I do think that there's a certain level of individu- individuation, is that the word, that comes in that time in life. And when young people are primarily just kind of sitting in their own bedrooms, like ch- G-chatting or Snapchatting their friends, mm-hmm. I wonder if they're missing out on forming certain parts of their personality that are only made through making errors and making mistakes and then learning from them, you know? So Absolutely. if you're overly safe, you're underexposed in my mind. Yes. In fact, uh, in some of the research I was doing about all this, um, one of the scientists was saying that they're actually – cues the brain needs that happen from body language and facial expressions, you know, so that we feel connected, that so that we can experience joy and connection and all of that. 
And we're not getting that through texting or through, you know, constant uh, contact through visual right. machines, really. When you were talking about that law school statistic, right, that people come out of law school with the higher depression levels, oh, and I'm yeah. sure John 40%. can speak to this, but I, I know several people who went to law school, and it was a very isolating time. So I don't I know if he imagine. can speak to that. but uh, it, it is isolating, but I think regardless of whether it's law school or a career that's too demanding mm-hmm. or social media, when you isolate yourself, you take yourself away from one of the most important things in life if you want to have a healthy life, which is um, social connection and interaction. Exactly. Because truthfully, yeah. at the end of the day, we are interdependent and we need interrelatedness to really yes. to flourish. Yes. Right. And we need, yeah. we need nature. You know, we need to move our bodies. We need to eat good food. And particularly, it's fun to eat food with other people, you know, and laugh. Maybe and we talk. should... You should make a call to bring back the Friday evening cruise. <laughs> and not, not a boat cruise, but the cruising of the boulevard. Yeah. Top down. We can use social media to announce that we're going to be cruising down the main uh, coast highway next Friday night, John. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think, I think Encinitas does something like that in the summer, and, and Escondido does too. And really? They're, they're worth checking out. There will be hundreds of people there with their cars uh-huh. and walking around. And oh, I, I've nice been time. to that thing. Yeah. yeah. And then there are the concerts well, in the park. Certain, I was going to say, I think there's also a response. Like, I, I do think this is an important topic, but I also don't think there's, like, zero awareness on, on this as an issue. You know, I've noticed, particularly when I lived in New Orleans, um, you know, for three years, that is a city that is so chock full of community where mm-hmm. people know their neighbors and go outside. And, you know, you have celebrations like Mardi Gras, which is like a huge citywide block party where everyone gets together and interacts and shares food and shares drinks and shares, you know, parades and parties and, and hangs out with children and celebrates life. And, you know, that was hugely important for me to spend time in a city like that where yes. social connection is everything. You know, that's your currency. And so I I do think there are, you know, people are becoming more conscious of this. You see communities kind of getting together to create community-wide events like John is mentioning. So um, I do think, you know, there are things out there. It's just a question of if people are even aware that they're isolating themselves. Mm -hmm. Because I think there is this sort of this idea that it's the norm to kind of just text your friends or send emails and like I would love to get a written letter from someone what a novelty that would be you know like it would be great to get something other than a yeah. bill in the mail yeah you know? that's a so such I a good there's point a, a social awakening that you know technology booming in the early 2000s was obviously a great thing the internet is an, an amazing wonderful thing and all the advents of technology we take advantage of even to do this radio show are such a gift but mm-hmm. we do with anything, there has to be a balance and we have to be very careful that, you know, we are using it in a balanced way. And I do think millennials as a generation are aware of this, you know, that it is necessary to put the phone down and read a book and, you know, go out with your friends and, and connect with your community. And I'm seeing a lot more of that even here in Los Angeles in the last five years than, you know, when I was a teenager growing up in this area, too. So I do think there is some of that. There's but hope, I think, huh? you know, yeah, I think there's hope, but I think maybe it's also just when you can spot the friend that's isolated or you have that friend or that mm. colleague who only emails or only texts and you never see them out, you know, maybe maybe the idea is you reach out to that person and oh, say, hey, I'd love I to love connect that. with you. Let's get a drink. Let's get coffee. Let's have a meal. Let's yes. go to a movie, you know, because we're all, we're all in it together. And I think that you know, I don't want to get into politics, but there's a very every man for himself vibe going on in this country right now. There is. And, and you know what, honey? I'm so sorry. More. We are out of time. And that was such a great point that you were making. But it is true. I think just that point of reach out if you see somebody that seems isolated. And we'll have to continue this discussion again. But thank you so much, Aaron, for being with us. And Absolutely. Thank you to all our listeners. You can hear us every Change It Up Radio is on every Saturday and Sunday evening at 7 o'clock. And you can also find us on all major podcast platforms and other stations across the country. Until next time, we'll see you then. Bye-bye.
Thank you, honey. I'm so sorry I had to yeah, cut you off. That was great. That's but okay. Awesome. Was that, that was good, Erin. Yeah, it was really good. All right. Yeah. So you right, uh, will continue your conversation, guys. All right. <laughs> we will. Thank you. Thanks for your right. input. See you, see you soon. Awesome. Talk to you soon, honey. Okay. Bye-bye. All righty. Bye. So now to our Facebook friends. <laughs> now we're going to go back to the very beginning. Oops. I do this every time. I forget talking to hear. They can't hear me. Um, now we're going back to the very beginning of the show that we did not yet record. And then we're going to interview John. So let me get myself organized here. We'll be right with you. All right. Okay. Yeah, you don't need that anymore. Oh, good. I don't need we'll these. Need it, no. Okay. So just remember, John, when you're talking, this will move with you. So, yeah, we're, we're live streaming. This will move with you. Okay. So, if you're if you want to look at me when you're talking to me, or like see, I will do this. So you do that too, and then they'll be sure they can hear you. Can you hear me now? <laughs> Not me, but I hope Todd can. All right. Okay. So let me just take a quick look here. All right. Let me just start here. That will be fine. We'll be with you momentarily. Oh, here's your bio. Right. So if you were just continuing the time, could you hit the the white button and then the red one and then the green one? <coughs> Ready? Welcome to Change It Up Radio with Paula Shaw. I am so delighted to have you here with me today. We are talking about the cost of isolation on our show today because isolation and alienation have become a real problem. And in studio with me today, you will be meeting shortly John Sahar, who is an attorney here in North County, San Diego area. And I'll be telling you much more about John in just a few minutes. But first of all, we want to share that we are being brought to you by Sherry Blair, who is a financial consultant that empowers women to understand their money and make it last. Sherry is, specializes in really being that unintimidating friend to women who might be experiencing a little embarrassment or concern that they don't really understand investing and all of that kind of thing. She takes them under her wing and she does amazing work with them. So. If you're one of those women, you want to talk to Sherry Blair, our financial consultant. So we're so glad to have you on the show with us today, listening in. We are all about change. Change It Up Radio is crea has been created because I want people to develop a more mm, comfortable relationship with change. You know, as humans, we tend to have this love-hate relationship with change. We need it or we'll get bored to death, but we hate the discomfort of it. And yet, all the growth, all the good stuff really happens when we're out of our comfort zone. And if we don't get comfortable with change, what are we going to do to keep our lives interesting, to grow and to evolve our relationships? So that's the mission of Change It Up Radio. We want to connect empowered women and men to have mutual respect and cooperation and, and loving communication as the central piece, the foundation of creating a new kind of conversation and a new way of being. So welcome to our show. I'm so glad you're here. Today, we're talking about the cost of isolation. And we have a real problem in our country today and actually all over the world. Um, isolation has become, isolation, alienation, loneliness have become real issues. The statistics tell us that over 25% of Americans have no meaningful social support at all. They say they don't even have a single person they can confide in. And outside of family, they, they feel like there's nobody. 
that's pretty amazing, isn't it? Especially for those of us who have been on Facebook and, and it seems like everybody is sharing everything with you about every moment of their lives, whether it's what they had for breakfast, the, the child's first step, the new puppy, you know, it's like everybody seems to be connecting and sharing. But the truth is that a lot of that is going on by people who are sitting alone in a room with a computer. They're not really interacting with other human beings. And there have been some very, very interesting studies done um, that are telling us that this is not a good thing for people, that humans need other humans. We need to actually sit in their presence. We need to make eye contact. We need to um, be able to eat together, talk together, laugh. We need to see their body um, posture. We need to be able to actually have eye contact or physical touch involved in that communication. And when we don't have that, there's a big, giant piece missing. And it's causing problems. We're looking at a plague of isolation in our country that is causing problems. Things like vulnerability to mental illness. Certainly, depression is a huge problem that's coming out of, of this isolation and alienation that's going on today. Um, a prevalence toward indulging in addictive kinds of behaviors is another result of what's happening because of the isolation that is existing in our, in our reality. People, one of the population areas that, and I think one we might all think about, and then again, maybe not, older people are having a real problem with isolation. Oftentimes, they live in situations that make getting out difficult. They don't have family or friends around to actually come and see them and check on them. And so they may spend their whole day in front of a TV or in front of a computer or in some other way that sort of seems like they're doing something. It sort of seems like they're connecting, especially maybe if they're actually putting things on Facebook. But when push comes to shove, they're sitting alone in a room in a chair. They're not out moving around. And, you know, we all know that as we get older, move it or lose it is sort of a truth, you know. We, we need to move our bodies. We need to exercise. We need to have um, social interaction with other people. And for a lot of people, this is a real problem among the older generation. There are also people who are experiencing a lot of isolation in their work environment. And, and this is a real problem. Um, some people spend their whole day in a cube or a cubicle in front of a computer. And again, even though there may be some chit-chat at the water cooler or coming or going from the office, a, <coughs> excuse me, a large part of the day is being spent in isolation. We're also looking at other areas of the population that really surprised me. One is the young people. I don't know about you, but when I was young, we hung out. You know, you were... There was the malt shop, the burger joint, the, the cruising on Friday nights, parties, you know, hanging out with your friends at school. I've actually lately been, been observing people in restaurants, even, even groups that are together, but they're on their phones. They're texting or they're communicating with other people that aren't even present while they're in the presence of people. And that just breaks my heart. I actually had a client tell me about an incident where her daughter had a sleepover party. And she was in another room, and she noticed it was just so quiet in the room where the, all the girls were for the sleepover. And so she walked in to see what was going on. And there they all were, lying around on the floor and in different positions, communicating with each other through text. They were gathered for a sleepover party, and they were communicating through texting each other. Now, that just blew my mind. That just absolutely, I couldn't figure out how that happens. 
but we're all seeing it everywhere we go. I was out to dinner with my daughter um, a week ago, and the table next to us never exchanged conversation with each other. There were four people, and they were all on their phones through the whole meal. This is not a good thing. You know, we are isolating and alienating ourselves. So my guest today, John Sahar, is an attorney. And one of the reasons I invited John to come and partake in this discussion with me is because attorneys are one of the groups that is most affected by what's going on right now in terms of isolation and depression and these situations leading to an increase not only in depression but in addictive behaviors, drinking, smoking, using, whatever, that soothes the pain, whatever helps them feel um, a little less alienated and isolated. It's not a positive thing. You know, for most of human history, people lived in small villages. They connected with each other. They, family was together, you know. There was social gathering, social interaction. And get a load of this. The scientists tell us that in some of the most primitive countries in the world where people are still living like that, there are the lowest rates of depression and isolation. We are human beings, and we were designed to connect with each other. We were designed to have physical touch. We were designed to look in each other's eyes and talk and say important, meaningful things. We were designed to have feelings, to feel those feelings and express those feelings. And if we're not doing that, if the only way I express my feelings is through emojis, something's wrong. Something's missing. And one of the statistics that blew me away, although so many of us um, think it would be so cool to go to law school or be an attorney, that upon entrance to law school, the depression statistics were very uh, common, normal. Eight or nine percent of the people were depressed. Upon graduation, 40 percent of those same students were depressed. Something's wrong here, and we got to figure out what it is. So in just a few moments, I will invite John Sahar, attorney at law, to have a little chat with me about all of that so we can maybe make some headway in what do we humans need to do? How do we get reconnected? What, do we, what are the ways that we can find to be more social? I don't know. I'd love to know what the listeners are thinking right now. I mean, I remember when I was a kid, we had block parties. I haven't heard of a block party in years. There were so many things that we did to connect. So in just a moment when we come back, we'll be exploring some of the ways we can connect and some of the ways we can overcome this isolation and depression. We'll be right back. Nailed it. I believe so. <laughs> so now you know the whole scoop. I want to just thank you for being with us, live streamers. We're on a, just a little bit of a break to see. Oh, yeah. now, you're, now if you'll hit the white button, good, and then the red one, and then just before <coughs> we start, we'll hit the green one again. Um, we are just regrouping for a moment here, John. John, do you have a website? I do. What is it? Sahar Law Firm. Okay, and do you want to, uh, when we have you give your contact info, do you want that to be just the website or do you want to give a phone number? Oh, phone number. Okay. Phone number's best. What's that? 760 683 2048. Okay. <coughs> All righty. Just find that paragraph again. Um, I did. No, I did. Is it still on? No. Oh, okay. I was just going to go with the short one. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Mm. Okay, this is what I want. Okay. Uh, 
oh, this was a thing I wanted to mention, too, about law. I'll, I'll get into that with you, though. Okay. Here we go. Okay, ready? Mm-hmm. Green button. Oh, ooh, ooh, wait a minute. I need to write myself a big note. Welcome back to Change It Up Radio with Paula Shaw. I am in studio now with John Sahar, an attorney here in the San Diego area. And he's going to chat with us in just a moment about this issue we've been talking about, isolation, alienation, and depression. Too many people are experiencing it. But first we want to just mention that we are being brought to you today by Sherry Blair, your financial consultant the woman's champion who empowers women to understand their money and make it last, Sherry Blair. Actually, she works with men too, I should say that. <laughs> but she is the woman's champion. So John Sahar graduated from right here in San Diego, the San Diego School, the University of San Diego School of Law in 1989 and has been practicing law in this area ever since. He has done work. He actually specializes in the area of personal injury, the area of personal. Well, let's try that again. <laughs> We're going to just start this whole thing over. So hit the white button, the red button, and then. You ready? Yeah, wait a minute. I want to get Sherry's thing ready. Okay. <laughs> Welcome back to Change It Up Radio with Paula Shaw. So glad to have you here with us today. We're talking about the cost of isolation, the alienation and the depression, and all of those issues that are way too prevalent in our culture and our society today. And in studio with me to talk about that, because one of the groups we were just discussing having a real problem with this issue is attorneys. So John Sahar will be joining me in just a moment. But first, I want to mention that we are being brought to you by Sherry Blair, the financial consultant who empowers women to understand their money and make it last. Call Sherry, especially you ladies, though, gentlemen, she works with you too. No discrimination here. <laughs> All right. So, John Sahar graduated from the University of San Diego School of Law in 1989 and has been practicing law in the area of personal injury ever since. Along the way, he worked with such luminaries as John Leonard, a former partner of Melvin Belli, who you all remember from cases in the past. <laughs> and he, in 1910, founded the Sahar Law Firm to assist residents of North County Indeed, to assist residents through the entire county of San Diego with all of their personal needs, personal injury needs. You know what? I'm just not happy with that. Can we start this one again? We can do whatever you want. <laughs> I got to make a note. For Although, God. I started the firm in 2010, not 1910. Did I say 1910? <laughs> oh, 19. good. So good thing we're doing this yeah, over. I, Sorry, guys. I just need to We're get getting there. Started. So we had two false starts. Do I, do I get two overs today? Yeah. <laughs> no. Come on. Once your part starts, it's, that's it. <laughs> okay. Let's try this again. One <laughs> more. Paul Shaw, take three. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Here we go. All right. Well, welcome back to Change It Up Radio with Paula Shaw, being brought to you by Sherry Blair, the financial consultant who empowers women to understand their money and to make it last. Very important issues to all of us, men and women. And by the way, guys, she does work with you, too. In studio now to talk with me to continue this discussion about the cost of isolation is San Diego attorney John Sahar. John graduated from the University of San Diego School of Law in May of 1989 and has been practicing law ever since then. He began his own firm in 2010, the Sahar Law Firm, to assist residents of North County and with their personal injury needs. 
John also, by the way, offers a free evaluation and consultation. And what I want to say about John, separate from the info on his bio, is that he is one amazing man. He actually listens to you. He actually takes a personal interest in what's going on in your case. And I think that's a much more important thing that I could say about him than anything that's in his bio. Yes, he's well-educated, and he's been practicing law a long time, but he's just really a good guy. So welcome, John. Thank you, Paula. I am so excited to have you here with me today. I'm happy, I'm happy to be here. <laughs> so we'll get ourselves situated so we can actually see each other. John, in my last segment, I was talking about this issue that's going on now, isolation, incredible isolation, even at a time when it looks like we're so much more connected than we've ever been. We've got smartphones, and we've got computers, and we've got Facebook, and we've got Instagram, and yet we've got a huge problem in our culture with isolation and depression. And surprisingly to me, in a recent article that the Tribune published, one of the groups that has the big attorneys, why do you think that is? Well, I, I, I don't think it's because they're using their phone too much. I think it's, <laughs> it's the requirement of their job. How do you mean? Um, the hours that you have to work when you're an attorney are, mm -hmm. are just huge. Yeah. So you, you, end up, you end up working 12 or 15 hours a day, sometimes, wow. sometimes longer. You mm -hmm. end up, like for my first eight years, Saturday and half day Sundays, that was, oh that my, was my rigor. Wow. I can remember I'd be, neighbors would be, you know, grabbing their newspaper from the front door and calling mm -hmm. me at night laughing at me for going to work so early. Uh, but that's, that's kind of what it takes to, mm -hmm. to succeed in this profession. And along the way, when you do that, you, uh, you do isolate yourself. You do, you do stop the social engagements. Um, but at some point, at some point, I think maybe this is where lawyers get stuck, it, it becomes a personal decision, and you have to make a decision of uh. what type of life you want to live. And truthfully, I, I have a handful of lawyers I know who – can't make that decision. They're stuck where they're at. They wish they could be with their wife more. They wish they could be with their kids more. Mm -hmm. But their job's too demanding, and they don't know how to get out of that job and, and put their career on something that would be more satisfying. And is that because you have to do so much research and so much writing and so much preparation, no matter what kind of law you're practicing? Well, in one level, when you're a brand-new lawyer, one of your functions is to make your boss money. <laughs> the way you make your boss money is winning by cases? working, winning cases, but really working hard and working a lot of hours. Oh. And there's sort of there's sort of a uh, um, an internship that goes on, you know, for mm -hmm. maybe four, six, or eight years of of real hard work. And then, in, if if you've risen to the top, you you have some options, and you can put a life on on the terms that you want. Mm -hmm. How does it get easier though? What what kind of shifts do you have to make? What did you do? Well, for me, it was it was. I just woke up one day and I wasn't comfortable with the with the way I was working and the way I was living. Mm -hmm. And um, my kids were starting little league, and I wanted to coach little league, and I had this very demanding job. And, um. Um, I literally, I just went to my boss and said, "I have to quit." Really. And uh, I I did six months later, and then I started my own firm, and that was in uh, January nineteen ninety seven. And um, it was it was it was a struggle, but I did all of that, and and basically what I ended up doing is I just double tracked my life. I I did the things that I needed to do to to keep my career going forward, but then I also I did the things I needed to do to have a um, fulfilled personal life. Mm -hmm. So I spent all the time that I needed with family and and, and raising my kids, and and uh, I spent all the time that I needed doing my work. And and on any given day, even to this day, I probably spend a fair amount of time doing both things. So but you you found a way to balance you the had situation. To balance it. Right. I wasn't I wasn't the I wasn't the guy who was going to work 11 and a half months super super hard to go sit on the beach for yeah. 2 weeks. That, <laughs> that was not me. Yeah, and that's true of so many people, isn't yes. it? I mean, that's what they consider is a way to live. Yeah. But I I think you remember you shared with me at one point that when you were in the midst of that Sort of craziness, if I mm -hmm. if I may. Sure. Um, but I understand it's like a necessary craziness to make it in this profession. Um, what was it though? Was there something that happened to you, or, or some event, or just 
Did you just have spontaneous insight that this wasn't the life you wanted to live? Well, I, I think it just is something for some people, if they have a self-awareness, it, it builds slowly, and then mm -hmm. it, it's sort of like you know, a wolf in your attic, and you ignore it and starts making louder and louder noises, uh -huh. and finally you have to <laughs> deal with it. And, and so, yeah, it, it, it was a level of discomfort that became intolerable, mm -hmm. and at that point, you have to act on it if you're feeling it. I think so many people don't act on the, that level of discomfort until the marriage is falling apart or their problems with the children or their drinking has or, or, become Or some not at all. They work through all of that. They work through the divorce. They work through having yes. terrible relations with their kids, and they work harder, and they work more, and they, all that stuff falls apart. Mm -hmm. and, and I think there's a lot of that uh, in the legal profession. And I, and I think you made a good point. It's not just the legal profession. I think any profession where there are a lot of demands for your time requires us to find a way to figure out balance. Life itself does, and, and mm -hmm. I think you can't get around the fact that we're, we're social creatures, and we're supposed to be interrelated, yes. and we're supposed to be interdependent, and we're, we're supposed to spend time together at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. you know? And I, I see, and, and I, gotta, I have to plead guilty <laughs> myself that so often if the choice is to go, maybe go to a happy hour with friends or finish something I have to write or prepping for the next day, I'll opt out, and I'll, one more time, find myself sitting in front of my computer all evening long instead of going out and doing things with friends. I do have a lot of friends, and I do try to find that balance, but, you know, uh, the temptation to do one more little bit of work, I think, is so great for all of us. Well, there, I just, I'm thinking of this book, um, don't sweat the small stuff, and it's all small stuff. You yes. Know? And I, I read that many years ago, and there was a discussion in there about your inbox is always going to be full even <laughs> up to the day you die. So you can't, you can't delay your yes. social life until you're done with your work because it won't happen. That's so true. It just won't happen. So true. And one of the things I was reading um, is that the prevalence of addictive behaviors, uh, this article was about attorneys, but I think it's true in all of society. The prevalence, because of this alienation, isolation, and the lack of just plain fun, people are drinking more, they're smoking more weed, they're do using other kinds of drugs because life is just painful. Life doesn't feel really good. It's not, um, they don't have anything to really look forward to. It's sort of that... Groundhog Day thing, you know, the rat on the yeah, hamster they're, wheel. Yeah, they're exactly stuck on the wheel without any feeling that it's ever going to get better. Yeah, and that's it, that, that sense of hopelessness and despair that this is it. Th that's a hard place to be, and, I, and, you know, I think it's at that point where you have to make a change, mm -hmm. and, and that, that's a very scary thing to do, and I think there's a lot of people who are right on that point, again, some lawyers that I know, but they're afraid to take the next step because yes. they don't know what it really is and they don't know what it's going to look like. Mm -hmm. And that, that's a hard place. And the economic concerns are a very real part exactly. of it, right? Exactly. Especially if your family has grown used to a certain level of financial abundance mm -hmm. and um, there's a house and there's maybe um, a spouse who hasn't been working because that wasn't necessary. Now to create a change like that impacts everybody around you. But I would like to think that when you make a change like that, the quality of your life improves so much that that impact on everybody around you is even more important and even richer. Oh, it is. It is. And I think I, you know, one of the benefits from, from making that, that change is the way you impact people and the way then uh, you become a model for them. Yeah. And, and, and then they now see somebody who handled this struggle in the right way. Mm -hmm. And if you're a parent, you really want your kids to see that. You don't want your kids to buy into, I have to find a uh -huh. hamster wheel to spend my life on. You want them to learn they can put their life on their own terms by um, taking the time to understand who they are and live accordingly. That is such a beautiful perspective. And I think it's true of most parents in, in theory. But what I see too often and, and the kids that I'll see in my private practice have parents who didn't have that kind of insight, who think that 
maintaining the material stuff is the most important focus. So other things are big things are falling by the wayside so that we can keep this house, you know, the fancy house and the Tesla and whatever else goes with it. Yeah, I think in my in my mind, um, it was control of my time that was my number one concern. Oh, and, I and love that. Going you back to that, yeah, it was let's, having control of my time. Let's start right there when we come back in the next segment, because okay. that's a very important piece. We'll be right back. <laughs> Welcome back to Change It Up Radio with Paula Shaw, being brought to you by Sherry Blair, your financial consultant the one who really educates women to know what to do with their money, how to best use it, and how to make it last. Because, ladies, we have to remember, a man is not a financial plan. <laughs> 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 right here in the studio with me <laughs> is a, a wonderful man, John Sahar, who I have been talking with in about this whole issue of alienation and isolation. John, for any of you who have just joined us, is an attorney here in the San Diego area who specializes in the area of personal injury. And John is one of, we've been looking at attorneys as a group that have really had some problems with isolation, alienation, and depression. And, and career dissatisfaction. And career dissatisfaction, absolutely. And in the last segment, John, you were just making a really huge point that one of the things that prompted you to change the way you practice law was that you decided you wanted control of your time. Yes, I, I, I felt I, I needed control over my time. Mm -hmm. I needed to, to have my day belong to me. I needed to, I, I mean, it's a simple thing. I needed to be a family person when I needed to be a family person. I needed to be a lawyer when I needed to be a lawyer. Uh. And I needed to have the ability to make the decision when I was going to do which. Now, it, it's not, I mean, it's not as if it's just uh, a happy-go-lucky life. I mean, there's periods when you are a lawyer that you are going to have to work. You mm -hmm. are going to have weeks where you have to work late, but it's not what most lawyers fall into doing is they just do that all the time, even when it's not necessary. And I mm -hmm. do it when it's necessary, but when it's not, I'm likely to do something that's personally enriching. Mm-hmm. What do you do in your off time? What do you do for what fun? I, what I do, I surf. <laughs> I ride All motorcycles. Right. Oh, I, I used surf to golf a and lot. ride motorcycles. Yeah. That's not the usual attorney, I would say. <laughs> no, I do. I do a lot of motorcycle riding, a lot of golfing, a lot of surfing. Good for you. I know you actually. I remember you telling me about a. You did like a long motorcycle trip, right? To I have. I have. Montana we to somewhere? to South Dakota. South Dakota. Every summer we go we go from Encinitas to Sturgis, South Dakota. Oh, that is crazy. And by the way, this man turned me on to one of the best barbecue places in the world on <laughs> Highway 395, the Copper Top. The Copper right? Top, yes. My children absolutely adore you as a result of that. <laughs> <laughs> Very good food. So the proof is in the pudding. This man really does know how to have fun and balance this word balance is one of my favorite words, and I think it's, it's, the key. It's, the, it's the key to happy living. If we can't find balance in, in anything, right, in, how, in our eating, our drinking, our, our working, our playing, you know, we have to find balance to well, make it all work. I think, I think at the end of the day, at the end of the day, life is a question of balance. It's a matter mm -hmm. of balance more than what you know or don't know or how rich you are, or how poor you are, or mm -hmm. where you live, or what you drive. It's really a matter of balance. Yeah, I love that idea. I think that's really true. And when people are balanced, you're right, so much of the other stuff doesn't matter because there's like this true joy. You know, one of the things I was thinking about when I was doing the research for this show, this issue of isolation and alienation is sort of the antithesis of joy and satisfaction and connection. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. Joy and satisfaction and connection. But when we're feeling alone and lonely and depressed and we're seeking some kind of joy in a substance or, you know, in a behavior that's not healthy for us, that's a pretty grim picture. And oh, yeah, that has to be. Yeah. It has to be very <laughs> isolating. Mm -hmm. And so we, we need to find ways to s change that picture. In your profession, here's one of the things I read that I thought was very interesting. 
And one of the top attorneys whose name escapes me right now, but I think they said he was even the head of the bar uh, association. This, and he's one of the top attorneys in the country. He too was in this uh, p this experience of isolation and depression and um, oversaturation. So, so and a lawyers have a name for it. It's called golden golden handcuffs. They call it where you're in a position where you're making too much money to quit. Uh -huh. But you're so dissatisfied that you have a hard time staying, and yes. they just sit there in that in that angst. Oh, that reminds me of a book I used to use when I was counseling couples called "Too Too Good to Leave, Too Bad to Stay." <laughs> it's mm -hmm. sort of the same idea, same thing right? with with your career. Yeah, but one of the ways this attorney solved the issue, he 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 definitely cut back, but he also took a personal interest in his clients and actually developed relationships with them that lasted even beyond the case. Now, you would almost think that's a question of um, ethics, but in his case, no, it seems like that really made I, the work more satisfying. I don't think that's ethics at all. I think that's, that's um, smart lawyering and, and smart uh, being a human being. And, yeah. and I, I will tell you that I have made that transition, and so at this point, I would say I have good relationships with all my clients, and mm -hmm. my clients are people that I like and people that like me, and I have clients who are not clients anymore who come back year after year to say hi or yes. to refer a family member or, or something like that, and that's a great thing for a lawyer because these people are coming to you with, with problems. Mm -hmm. They're coming to you with um the, the, the fullness of who they are, mm -hmm. and, and, and they come to you vulnerable, and, and you get to meet them, you get to educate them, you get to assist them through a very difficult time in their life. Right. And, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a good thing to take that as, a, as an open journey, and mm -hmm. I think that's what this lawyer is talking about, and that's how you, you get close with your clients, you bond, you get a higher degree of satisfaction with your work. Yeah. You, you know, you get much more connected. Wow, you know, uh, as I'm listening to you, I'm thinking, you and I have so much in common in that people are really coming to us in similar circumstances. You know, they too come to me during sure. difficult times of their lives. And, and it is one of the things that I'm proudest of and happiest about that I have clients that still call, will check in every once in a while or send me a note or a Christmas card because we had a relationship that was beyond just sitting in that office. Yeah, and, and the fact that... that we carried them through a very difficult time with, mm -hmm. with a certain amount of um, integrity in class, and, and it's yes. just a good thing. Yes. It's just a good thing. And as one of your clients, I will happily confess, <laughs> 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 I can attest that you are, you do have a real caring a presence. I mean, I know when I talk to you or if something comes up in my case, you really want to hear what's happening. You really are invested as a human being. It's not just a job that you do. Yeah, absolutely, and I, and I and that's just the way that I like to do it. Mm -hmm. And it's just almost uh, it might sound cliche, but it's just the way I was raised. And, yeah. And so I just had to bring that connectedness into my practice, mm -hmm. and and it's just been wonderful. Well, this this word connection is the opposite of isolation. Exactly. Right? So exactly. If we if we don't find ways to bring that into our life, we are going to end up one of these statistics that we've been talking about today. We I are think we have end to, yeah. With issues of depression or anxiety or addictive disorders or relationships that are in total distress. Children who are having terrible problems because we're so focused on earning a living. I think it's a real problem here in San Diego because... It's not inexpensive to live here. It's not inexpensive, and there's I'm, a lot of beautiful people with beautiful lifestyles. They almost, yes. th you know, they look like they're a Facebook kind of life. That's right. But they're walking around, and, and, and so if you're not careful, you start comparing. You do. Yeah. You do, absolutely, and get caught up in, you know, my daughter likes to, to call, um, like on Facebook, everybody's showing their shiny self, you know, like right. everybody's showing the the good side of the picture but we're not necessarily seeing what's going on in reality or or what goes on inside their hearts and one of the things i can tell you because i have lots of clients in this area that are of all economic levels having the stuff 
doesn't necessarily create the joy. Not at all. Not at all. No. And I know you came upon that issue in your own life many years ago and made a choice to scale back, to do it your own way, to actually connect with your clients and to um, balance the time spent at work with the time spent in your in your real life, right, and, and with your family. Yeah, and I think I think everybody would do that if they knew they had the option of doing that. Yeah, that's a really interesting point. But you feel like some people just don't think there is any other option. I except believe what that they're doing. Yes, huh? I think that's that's really an interesting point, and I I gotta believe it's true because, especially in my work, by the time they show up at my office, you know, to to get some help with whatever life transition they're going through or whatever loss or trauma, things are pretty bad. You know, things, right. uh, right. somebody right. or some circumstances said to that person, okay, I got to do something different. Some people, some people prefer isolation because of trauma they've been through. Yes. It's just easier for them to be isolated than to come out of it. That is so true, John. Yeah. You know what? I want to give everybody your contact info because I have a feeling there's a lot of people out there going, ooh, that's the attorney for me. There's actually a good guy in that profession. <laughs> I don't mean to insult anybody else who's in it because I do. Kn I know some very wonderful attorneys. There are a lot of wonderful there attorneys. Are there are a lot, lot of, wonderful of wonderful attorneys. Ones. Yes, they, they, there are a lot of jokes made about attorneys, but I, I will are. attest to the fact that there are a lot of great ones. But John's website is saharlawfirm.com. That's S A H A R L A W F I R M. Two H's. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Two, Two H's. H's. S A H H A. Oh my God, I've been misspelling your name. S A H H A R. <laughs> Lawfirm.com. And then I'll give you my phone number 760 683 2048. So please take his version of that information and not mine. John, if you'll stay with us in our next segment, we're going to bring my daughter into the discussion to get a millennial perspective on Perfect. all of this. All that. right. And one more time, your your website, John? Sahar Law Firm, S like Sam, A, two H's, A-R, L-A-W-F-I-R-M dot com. Okay. And your phone number? 760-683-2048. And we'll be right back. That's okay. Have, <laughs> I don't know. All right, live streamers. Yeah, we were out of order, but that actually is it. We have completed the recording of this show, which will air April 28th. So in the meantime, you can keep broadcasting. You can find us on every major podcast platform. And uh, you'll be here at AM 1170 The Answer every Saturday. Talking into the <laughs> Her lips are moving, but there's no sound. <laughs> that was Todd, my sound engineer, <laughs> who just knew he had to come in here and stop me from doing this to myself again. Okay, so just to repeat what I was saying, <laughs> thank you for being with us. We, we always enjoy having you here when we're recording the show. This show will air on April 28th, 7 o'clock. We're on every Saturday and Sunday evening at 7 o'clock. So please join us again for Change It Up Radio with Paula Shaw. Thank you for being here. Bye-bye. Thank you, John. Oh, thank you, Paula. <laughs>